good to be high. I used to get high as the sky I used to. Uh, high on Jesus. High on, not high on life, but high on the one who is called the life. And um, the joy of the Lord, eh? that's our strength. Not the joy of, not even the joy of stuff happening. The joy of blessings. Blessings come and go. Hard times come and go. Good times come and go. But the Lord doesn't come or go. And he's, there's joy in his presence forevermore. It's the joy of the Lord. Amen. That's our strength. It gives us the, the car to continue on. The joy of the Lord. G'day, Kate. Is that you? No, it's not. Looks like you, though. Anyway, <laughs> kia ora. <laughs> oh, I should have got a spec savers. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord. So this morning I want to uh, put number one uh, PowerPoint up, please. Oh, it's Chris there today. Yeah, there we go. There's someone, I heard this profound statement that there are the two most important days or two of the most important days of your life is the day you're born, obviously, and the second one is the, the, the day you know why. The day you know why. So a lot of us, you know, we were born, so that, that important day is done. But the second question, many still don't know why. And I want to share a bit about why are we born? What is the purpose for your life for 2023? Perhaps some would tell you, well, the purpose for your life is to get married, have children, have a good life, and then die happy. Others might say, well, the purpose of life is to use your gift or your ability, your life, to, to make a difference in the world. Earn lots of money to do something, and then die happy. Selfish people might say, nah, just get what you can. <laughs> die miserable. <laughs> I don't know. D different people have different concepts of what the purpose of life is. But what is the biblical concept of the purpose of life for you and me? The scriptures say the biblical concept of the purpose of our life is to glorify God. It's to glorify God. Number two up, please, Chris. Let's read these words. These are the words of Jesus just before he, he left the earth, just before he went through his crucifixion, death, and ascension. So let's read them together. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. Amen. So every one of us have been created to do a work. There's some form of mahi in our life that God has created each one of us to do. And when we discover what that is that God created us to do in this world, not when we get to heaven, but in this world, that glorifies God. And that's just what Jesus said. I've glorified you. I've finished the mahi. And um, I want to share this message this morning. Hopefully, in some way, it can help give you some understanding about how you are glorifying God, how you can glorify God on a conscious basis, and how it can encourage you in the work. Some of you already know the work God's called you to do. Some of you are still discovering that. But hopefully this message will encourage everybody, no matter where you are. <clears throat> At the end of our, my days, will my life glorify God? Will I have been an expression of Jesus to my family first, my immediate family. <laughs> That's the most important thing. I've got to be an expression of Jesus to my immediate family. If my life hasn't made any difference to my wife, have I made a difference? Has Jesus made a difference maybe in our marriage? Uh, my kids, my mokos? Anyway, it, it, that's the first thing. But then to my church, then to my community, uh, has my life made a difference? Has it been part of the solution or has it been part of the problem? <laughs> According to the Department of Stats, the average income of the most working Kiwis is, is around about, or just over $61,189 per year. I thought that was quite low, but I, I just kept looking at it, but that's the same number they keep coming back. The average wage of the average Kiwi is $61,000. Oh, what's that one? <laughs> okay, yeah. Do you know, and the... the News Talk ZB revealed that it costs 150000 
to keep just one person in prison a year. That's huge, isn't it? From 61,000 to 150. I think I'll go and join the prison. I'll get more that way. No, no, just joking. And this isn't a slamming the prisoners. This isn't a slamming prisoners at all. This is just a, this is just a reality that's going on in our society that a good question to ask is, an insightful question to ask is, from time to time, is my life contributing to the well-being of my community or is it taking from the welfare of my community? Good question to ask, to keep in your heart. What is my life doing, contributing or taking? And God so loved the world, he contributed, he gave to the world. And so how can you be sure your life is contributing? How can I be sure on a daily basis that my life somehow is contributing to the well-being of my community? Am I adding to? Am I a problem or a solution? Well, some people, in order to become a solution or part of the answer to, get to society, some people uh, join the police force. And they feel that through being part of that organization that they help some way contributing to the well-being of their community. And they are. Yeah, God bless the police, the thin blue line. Some join the army because that's their way of, of seemingly join that organization because that contributes to the well-being of a nation. Um, some join the medical uh, fraternity, become doctors or nurses because that's their way of belonging to that organization. They're bringing some form of healing to mankind. Understand this? And that's good, eh? Part of my purpose <clears throat> for 2023, part of our purpose, is that we belong to a community of faith. We're a church, but we belong to a, we're also a community. And we're a community of believers. And through our, through, through our working together as a community of faith, as a church, we bring good into our communities. This house as with other churches, helping bring some good into our community. Would you say? I would say. Ah, oh, it does. And I'm proud of this church. I'm proud of the work that it does in our community. And I'm proud to be part of it. And the fact that I'm a part of it means I'm part of the solution in a wider, in a wider context to the community. Um, see, the, the, the church has been incredibly powerful. The church has been the major agent of change since the death and resurrection of Jesus. The church of Jesus Christ over the centuries has been that which has birthed into society. Uh, ministries, and let me read you some. The positive impact of the church cannot be overstated. <clears throat> Guided by the teachings of Jesus Christ, it has been a, a salt and light in, in, in the world. Church communities over the world have founded schools, hospitals, orphanages. Christians have campaigned for prison reform, better housing, and an end to the slave trade. They have established a huge number of charities to support the poor, underprivileged prisoners and their families, the homeless, and those seeking justice. Some Christians have involved in setting up many of the best-known charities, such as Oxfam, the Salvation Army, St. John's, the Samaritans, the RSPCA, uh, people like Mother Teresa, people like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, leader of the civil rights music movement, music movement. Um, so churches throughout the centuries have been used by God to bring incredible changes in, in, in society. And church is a community. Churches are made up of communities. And, um, and so I'm, I'm pleased, I'm proud, and I'm blessed to be part of this church community that God uses to bring solutions into our community and to our wider community. It's such a, such a blessing. And so if you want to know, know what is the purpose of life, it's to bring glory to God and it is to, to do the work that he created us to do. And the work we're called to do is love God and love one another. Aroha ki te atua, aroha ki te tangata. And that love for one another is expressed by whatever gift that God has given you to express that love or that expression of Jesus. For me, I move mainly in signs and wonders and miracles, but there are others, and the expression of Jesus is through your teaching gift at school and the way that you're like 
Jesus is manifesting through you in your teaching gift, or maybe in the hospital through your nursing gift, or maybe in the forestry just through the mahi you're doing. Whatever we do, if we do it as unto the Lord, then it's glorifying the Lord. Whatever we do, if I'm the street cleaner, if I'm doing it as unto the Lord, that's my work. That's glorifying God, eh? So, so whatever work I do, that if it's glorifying God, how does it glorify God? If I do it as if I'm serving Jesus. So it might be the most boring, mundane, horrible job that you're tasked with. And if you just do it because someone has to do it, and you're the lowest on this, you're, you're at the bottom of the food chain, so you get to do the, take the garbage out, you get to clean up the rubbish. Anyone been in a situation like that? Figuratively speaking, not necessarily literally. Take the garbage out. Then it's, it's just a bore and a chore. But if you do it as unto the Lord, Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the, word, the reward because you serve the Lord. If you do it as unto the Lord, you're glorifying the Lord. That becomes part of your work you're created for on the earth. It may not be all the work you're called, but it becomes part of the good works that you were created for. So whenever I or you do something, and it might not be the best job, but if the heart attitude is, I'm doing this unto you is for your glory, Jesus. I'm doing this to bring glory to you. I'm going to do it with a good attitude, not a bad one, not a stink one, not a why am I having to do it. I do it for you, to glorify you and you alone. I don't do it to be, for, for others to see or to give me a pat on the back. I don't do it for recognition by any human being on the planet. I do it for recognition and honor and glory to you, Jesus of Nazareth. That is one way of personally glorifying the Lord and fulfilling that which we were created for. i just throw that out there for free. Uh, but being part of a community of believers who think like that, being part of this faith community, wow, a community can touch a community. A person can touch a community, but a community has a far greater impact on community. So church is community. When Jesus said, I will build my church, he means community. Jesus drew a community to himself. Everybody's looking for... Could you put the next one up, please, Chris? So everybody, the world looks for heroes. They're looking for the latest and the great. Look, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, somebody-man, woman, Wonder Woman. Uh, the world looks for heroes, and heroes are okay. Celebrities aren't necessarily heroes, by the way. Celebrities can be famous people, sports people, um, actors... But it doesn't mean they're a hero. They're just well paid and they're good actors and they can sing well. That's great. This, that doesn't make a hero. A hero is someone like Martin Luther King. A hero is like Mother Teresa. Somebody who has done something, con contribute to the well-being of society. That's a hero. <clears throat> I've got heroes. We've all got Christian heroes, I guess. Ratana. Uh, te whero, whero. Uh, uh, William Williams. Uh, Wigglesworth. John G. Lake, Catherine Kuhlman, uh, Reinhard Bonnke. We all got heroes, and it's all great. It's good to have a hero, because heroes help you to aspire to, to be what Jesus called you to be. But, um, but sometimes the church looks for heroes. We look for the latest ministry from overseas to come to New Zealand to change the, the nation, or some prophet from, oh, I don't know, from Timbuktu is going to come and speak to the nation of, the, of, of New Zealand. We're going to change. And sometimes we can look for heroes, and... But I think God is looking for a people, not a, not a person. Yeah, amen. I think God today is looking for a people. And Jesus, he, he didn't look for a person. He looked for a people. And he called 12 people to himself. And out of that little community, it grew to 70. And out of 70, it grew to 120 on the day of Pentecost. And that little community of those of faith, God touched them, filled with the Holy Ghost. And they, that in one day, it touched 3,000. And the community of faith began to touch the wider community. And I thank God that being part of that community, I think, far, I'm part of the solution in the earth. Well, being part of this community is also being part of the solution of the earth because it's a community of faith that Jesus is able to express himself through into our wider community. And so if you want to find your purpose, if you're a part of this church, if you serve in this house, I mean, the ones who come here Sunday after Sunday and serve in the house, and they give up their time, they give up their energy, they give up their life, they give up their tithes, they give up their offerings, they just give. Well, as a result of you being part of this house, you're contributing to the well-being of this city. 
you're contributing to the well-being of our community because the ministries of this church are wide and varied and touch thousands and thousands of people every year. Every year. People you may never ever meet. And that's the thing I'm going to be able to say when I leave this earth, Jesus. I've glorified you on the earth. I've done the mahi. I've done the work you call me to do. And what is that work? I don't, the work's not just one thing. This, what is your destiny, Pastor? Well, it's to do, 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 do this. It, it's more than just destiny. It's more than one thing. It's a combination of things. Jesus, what was the reason, the purpose, the destiny of Jesus? To die on the cross for our sins? Yes, it was. But it was to reconnect us to the Father. It was to heal the sick was to feed the hungry. There are so many things Jesus did. And the culmination of his life, I have finished the work. But his work was, was combined of many different works. Ephesians 2.10 says about believers, you and I, we were created for good works in Christ Jesus that he created for us to do before the world was formed. Good works. Not a good work, good works. But the end of our life, our life is a a good work, but it's a combination of different things we've done to serve Jesus and to serve people. So I used to get hung up, well, what is my destiny? What's the one thing I've been created to do? What am I called to do? And sometimes we, can get, we can't see the trees for the forest because we're looking at all these one thing, but it's not one thing. It's getting up in the morning and saying to God, this is the day you made and I worship you. That's part of the work I was created for, to glorify God. It's to say hello to my wife and Make her a cup of tea and some toast with veggie might. <laughs> Not every morning, of course. It's, it's, it's to be a good husband. That's part of, that glorifies God, eh? It's part of our good work. It's to say, hi to mum or to dad. Or to be, it's, it's, it's a combination of works. It's not just one thing. Our destiny is not just one big, super, natural, extraordinary, look at that. You get taken up by a chariot into heaven. Yo-ho, Silva! Like Elijah, got taken up to heaven by a chariot. Oh, that was his destiny. Look at that. Man, Lord, what am I created to do? When you're coming to do something like that for me so the world can see. And I'm, it's a combination sometimes of very boring, mundane things. Did you get that? Sometimes doing the work of God and glorifying God is a combination of very mundane, day-to-day -day things. Sometimes they're boring. Sometimes they don't feel exciting. It's not raising the dead every second. It's just being a good wife, being a good husband, being a good neighbor, going to work on time, <laughs> not grumbling about the boss, praying for him, her, giving your best, being contributing to the well-being of our community for the glory of Jesus. And so being part of a community is part of our destiny, part of why you were created, I was created. That's, a, that's quite easy, isn't it? Next one, please. Chris. Can we read this together? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous life. So we are a chosen people. Not a chosen person, a chosen people. I believe God is looking for a people and uh, wants to empower people, communities of faith. And um, it's not new to us, but this is just what I feel to bring forth in Vision Sunday. The next one is that the, our people are the ones that are going to restore the broken foundations of generations. We read the next scripture. Those from among you, a people, shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Our streets are brokenness. There's brokenness in our streets. And that brokenness could be manifested through unemployment, through illiteracy, through violence, through addictions. And we know the spiritual answer is Jesus. But in order to bring that answer of Jesus, it's about ministering to the natural needs first. To, Jesus didn't say, tell the people, clothe the people with a robe of righteousness. He said, give them some clothing. I was naked and you gave me some clothing. And don't tell the hungry, 
about how they should cannot live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. It's give them some food. It's practical ways. And I thank God for this community, this church community that, that does that. It's a day that from, shall, from among you, and those from among the community of faith, Jesus said, will restore the foundations of many desolations. <clears throat> so it takes a community to change a community. Um, next one, please, Chris. Thank you. Okay, and these are the words of Matthew 16, 18. I love this scripture. It says, Jesus said, I will build my church. But I put the word community there because church is a community. So it has a different sort of a slant on it, but it's saying the same thing. But it, for me, it brings a more personal. What is the church? The church is many things to many people. The church is corporate. The church is large. The church has been misrepresented many times. But he says, I will build my church, my community, you and me, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Isn't that cool? We're part of that community Jesus said, I will build. So uh, next one, please, Chris. Uh, so this community of Norm and Jess, Tan and Kelly and Ginger <laughs> moved up from a community in Omaru. So we're part of a community of faith in Omaru called Omaru Elam Church. And that, little, that community sent us up as a little community. And this is our first service. One of our first services in Teapara School Hall, you may not be able to see it very clear from where you are, it's not digitized, it's way back in the 90s, <laughs> it's not that flash, 32 years old, and standing at the door there's a lady and uh, uh, Derek Biddle, that lady with the black hair is Jean Clark, she had black hair back then, and, um, and I don't know if you can see me, I'm sitting down talking to somebody, I also have black hair, and that guy with no hair, that's, that's Graham, that's Graham Lancaster. He was one of, the, one of the first that came to this church. Anyone remember Graham? Graham Lancaster? Yeah. And Margie and Lance Rickard and the Seymours and the, and the Bateses and, the, and, and the Dougie Tamatia <laughs> and uh, Hallett and Whittemur. Like all the, so, that, that was a, so the church was a community, a small community, me and Jess, Kelly and Tant and Ginger. Out of that community of faith of believers, the community grew into Harper School Hall. And over months, as that community grew, it became a bigger and bigger community. And next, next one, please. And, um, and so the community grew, and one day the community said, can we do a, um, you know, do a street parade? They're doing street parades, Christmas parades. Can we be in the street parade? Can we you know, take the church, represent the church? So the community... This community, the band members got on the back of this truck and were playing music as they drove down the main street called House of Breakthrough. It's amazing. And uh, sometimes we didn't have a building to go to, so we had to be down at the cut and we would have church down there. And that was also wonderful. And there's one of the first men's group we had. Community. Next one, please. And that community, one day decided to march from Gizzi to Te Aroha all the way and pray every step of the way carrying a big white cross. <laughs> we walked all that to Te Aroha. Took, uh, I think it took the whole week, five days. We prayed over every step of this East Coast, praying for the well-being of our community. And um, yeah, there were logging trucks then too. And uh, that, those two Scotch fellas there, that's me and Trev McDowell. It's one of the services we did called Braveheart. And... Uh, Trev touched the community. Now he's over him and Debbie over in Tauranga. And they've touched the community over there for a community of faith they're part of has grown to touch the community of Tauranga. And uh, next one, please. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, and this, so this community has not just touched our nation. It's touched overseas. It's touched Fiji. It's touched India. It's touched... Next one, please. It's touched Omaru. It's a community of faith down in Omru, the place we come from, the community that sent us. This community is sent back, and there's a community of faith down there that's touching the community of Omru, which is awesome. Pastors uh, Damien and Jacinda. Next one, please. And you, this top photo is of this church, but it didn't have the, the, um, the evolution block right there. Evolution. They didn't have the sound desk there. But this community is responsible for sowing into India and causing a huge community over there to grow. 
and it's touching and changing the lives. It's making a difference in the community of the Muslim, Hindu, communist, and Christian community. It's, it's making a huge change with education, breaking the power of literacy and poverty and unemployment. So I'm so blessed and proud to be part of this community. I'm fulfilling part of the purpose of God and bringing it, making a difference to our city by being part of this community, this church community, this faith community. And God bless the other faith communities as well. Yeah. And it's not just us, it's the APOs and there's the AOG and there's the Anglicans and we're all part of the faith community whānau. And it's good that we can work together when we can, but I want to focus on our calling, on this church's call, not just the combined working together, but we must focus on this call, this church. Because every church has a plan, God has a purpose, hey. And the seven churches of the book of Revelations, Jesus spoke to each church and every church he spoke to had a different assignment, if you like. And, you know, we know Jesus was sort of, you know, stirred some up, encouraged them all, but he stirred, the, he stirred some up. There's two he never had to, had to stir up. He just... But you now all those churches now, they're in the nation of... The, well, they're in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And every church now is in a Muslim nation. And there's only a couple of churches where there's, church, where there's Christians in that city still to this day. So things come and go and change, but I want to make sure that it's out at this church, this community, that we fulfill what Jesus created us for in Tairawhiti. And I believe what we're doing by the way we're taking Christ and expressing him into our community is one of the reasons this church exists, for the glory of God. Next one, please. Uh, what would Jesus do? Now, I want to just talk on a personal note just to you and I. How can I encourage, how can we encourage one another to get become more like Jesus? Who needs, who is still on the journey of becoming more like Jesus? Okay, all you others, you have to put your hand up, we'll cast those demons out of you later. <laughs> Come out! We're all on a journey. Even Paul the Apostle said, I haven't made it yet, but one thing I pursue that which is before me, forgetting what is behind. We've got to forget our failures. We've got to move over. We've got to put closure on some things and pursue Jesus. Pursue to be more like him. To be like him. To allow more of him change us on the inside. So outwardly we change. So that, that's a lifetime thing. So you're going to be doing that till the final breath on this earth. Okay, boy? Then you go to heaven and suddenly you're transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, but in the meantime, that's our individual responsibility to become more like Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not 24-7 thinking about Jesus. I'm driving down the road. I'm busy looking out for the cars that are coming. You, know? you, you don't 24-7 consciously have your thoughts on Jesus. My spirit does. My spirit's always happy and praising, but my conscious mind... I'm not always thinking about Jesus. But every now and again, you know, I'll, you, I'll drive past somebody and I'll see, oh, man, they need some help. And there's something inside and sometimes I'll go back and help them and sometimes I won't. And um, because, yeah, it, it's just, and then later on I get home and think, oh, I should, I think that was an opportunity from God. I should have gone back. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? So here's a little method of, that helps me too, and I've been using it lately. It's this little bangle thing. I don't. I'm not a bangle person. But I've got to wear this one. It's got WWJD, which the words means the acronym means "What would Jesus do?" And, I, and, and we've only got a few here, but you know, just grab one when you leave that "Just Ask Me" desk. Just throw a gold coin in the in the tin there. Um, we've only got we've already given them most of them, a lot of them away at the. 8.30 service, and we're going to get some more in. I want to get some silicone ones you can roll on, roll off. These are too fiddly to tie up, but anyway. It's a reminder of what would Jesus do. It's a reminder for me, Thano. It's a reminder for me. What would Jesus do? And it's to help me consciously uh, to keep my mind on the purpose I was created, to be conformed to the image of God. And so what would Jesus do? It's something that, so if you want to say, what take away from this message? From the, Well, I'm a community of faith that's making a difference in the world. It's part of my purpose. I'm connected to something that's making a difference for the glory of God in my own community. Number two, 
What would Jesus do? I want to become more like Jesus. I'm going to take this reminder. What would Jesus do? <clears throat> it's helpful. Me and Jess, we encourage one another. And she said, mm, what would Jesus do? Would Jesus do that? <laughs> yeah, iron sharpens iron. Especially if yeah, I could be kinder. What would Jesus do? If I could be more, I don't know, more this, what would Jesus do? Not what would pastor say, not what would the church do, but what would? And this is where it brings on a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. Everything is about relationship with Jesus. Everything we do as a church, as a house, out of relationship of our love for Jesus. That's what it is. Everything we do, our expressions of our ministry as a church, must be done out of our relationship, of our love for him and his love for us. I mean, because if we don't do it out of that relationship of love for him, it becomes a religious duty. It becomes what we think we have to do, what the church must do. I must do this. And we begin to come under our own little laws and we have these little laws that we build up in ourselves. They may not be the Ten Commandments or the laws of the Bible, but their own personal laws and little expectations. I've got to be try, try to be more like this. I've got to do this. And it becomes a religious duty or something we do out of uh, fear or out of guilt instead of what would Jesus do? Just do it out of, oh, he would do this to be more like Jesus, out of relationship and love for Jesus. Amen. What would Jesus do? So welcome to the WWJD Club, guys. <laughs> and like I said, I don't wear bangles, but I'm going to wear this because this is going to open up doors. People are going to say, what's that? So I'm going to be able to tell people who don't know Jesus what it means. And it might spark all sorts of conversation. Oh, you're one of those blue, blue, blue Christians, are you? And I said, yeah, why do you say that? Oh, blue, 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 blue. I said, well, that's obvious it was. They might have had a bad experience, but I said, what, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And be able to open up and share what Jesus would do and help them to have an understanding of the concept. Who is Jesus? How will they know unless we tell them? So this is a good opportunity to interact with those who don't know Jesus. So, so what would Jesus do? Then I got thinking, but some people don't know what Jesus would do because they don't know what the Bible says about Jesus. Some people don't read the Bible. So... I had this idea, and I'm going to encourage everyone in the house. You might have your own Bible reading program. Good on you. Well done. I do. But the, there's Bibles you can buy. In the New Testament, the words of Jesus are written in red. And next one, please, Chris. I want to encourage you to read the red this year. Just read the red in your Bible. Just read the words written in red, that's the words of Jesus. And as you just read the red, the Holy Spirit will give you revelation of what he would do, who he is, and it will draw you closer to him. Don't study Leviticus. I mean, study it if you want. But it's not, it's, you know, you'll find Jesus in there somehow through all the dust because he's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a shadow of, of the fullness to come. But you're going to find more about Jesus when you read the red. And so buy yourself a Bible. If you haven't already got one with the red writing, go and buy yourself a Bible. Make sure you get one. With the, you know, they, they come with all sizes of, of prints. So make sure you get a print that you can read. We've got one here. We've got one sent. But the, the print's like, you have to look at it through a microscope. <laughs> so for those who are visually impaired, you need to maybe get a bigger Bible. Bigger. Anyway, read the red. Because the red will help you know what Jesus would do. And what Jesus would do, and what Jesus was, he's part of a community. And this community is called the church. And this church is part of that community that Jesus built, started 2,000 years ago. So in closing, Farnham, in closing, um, before I came to, to Gisborne, please excuse me if you've heard it a thousand times, the vision that I was given. Come to Gisborne, how I was taken up into the sky, looked down on Podfordy Bay, saw these war canoes in the water, heard a voice say to me, come to this place, start up a warrior church, moves in the nine gifts and the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. And then the, by the wind of my spirit, I will send these waka into the nation and the nations. So that's the vision that many of you heard over and over again. Amen? 
But there's a part of the vision at the start, and I, I, I know I've shared it many times, but some people said, I never heard that part before. It's, it's probably because, well, I don't know reason why, but I'm going to share the part that many have never, uh, or never heard. Maybe they're taken up by the, by the walkers or by the people walking on the water. I don't know. So here's something that happened in that vision that's really important for me and for you and for us as a church. So in the vision, because this church was birthed out of revelation from Jesus Christ to come here and do this work for him. This church is his work. Yeah? Yeah, I, I might be the pastor today, but um, you know, one day I won't be here. This church, this work is for him. This is about him, for him, and through him. Amen? So we are here by revelation of Jesus Christ to come here, confirmed by Jesp, confirmed by our pastor, confirmed through scripture, confirmed through signs and wonders to come here and plant a church, which we did in 1991, 28th of April. And so, but part of this vision, Fano, is while I'm hovering in the air, looking down on the poverty bay, and out of my peripheral vision, there's the bay, there's the cut. There's down by the river, Turanga River. The cut is down there. Okay, are you with me? So out of my peripheral vision, I see myself standing down there. Obviously, I, I saw that. I thought, oh, that must be me in the future coming to this place, sharing the gospel. But it's not just me. There's a lady down there, and she's digging herself into the ground. She's digging herself like in a, well, into a grave, actually. She's got a spade. Or a shovel, not a spade. She had a shovel. And she was digging, and she was getting deeper and deeper into this hole in the ground. And she was burying, basically digging herself into the ground to bury herself. And I saw that, and I saw myself speaking. And as the words came out of my mouth, she, she turned her ear and started listening to what I was saying. And those words went into her. This, that was hope went into her. The hope went into her. And instead of digging herself and she began to dig herself, literally, she dug herself out of the pit, out of the grave. And as she stood there, I saw God do something, cleanse her. I saw this cleansing come over her, because she's, she's rough. She'd been through a rough time. I, when I looked at her, she was in her mid-30s maybe, and she is straggly, and she'd been through many hard times. I could tell she's, she's had it, suffered a hard life, like the woman at the well. And life was not good for her or easy for her. And, and so she stands there and then this cleansing comes over and she becomes washed, by, I guess, by the blood of Jesus. And then she began to walk. I'm not doing anything other than sowing hope into her. She walks on the water and takes a seat in the walker. And then the wind comes, the walker moves her. I, and I realized I didn't make the walkers. I didn't put them in the walker. God knows for the last 32 years we've tried to get these walker in the water. <laughs> we've raised up warrior courses to raise up warriors to man the walker, to change the city, to change the nation. Oh, but I've gone back to the original vision and I'm going to do what I was called to do at the start, which was just to speak hope into people's lives. And out of the hope that was spoken into people's lives, that's how this church grew. That's how it became to what it is today. And now I look at that vision, I think, that was me speaking. Who was I speaking to? Was I speaking just to people in general? In Tairawhiti, was I speaking to the bride of Christ? I think that person now is not me, I think it's you. I think that, that I just represented me, that I was a representative of this church to come, and that we will be a church that speaks life, into our community of people who are digging themselves into their own graves. For they that shall be of you will restore the foundations of the desolations of many generations. They that shall be of you. I believe, I feel that just as I was used and Jess was used to speak life and hope into people, that we, the church, are called also just to continue to do that, what we're doing, speak life and hope. And I'm going back to just focus on what I'm called to do and what I know to do. I'm not going to try and do what I can't do. God has to build these walkers. I can't. 
God has to raise up the warriors or head up these walkers in our city, our coast. I can't. We've tried. God knows we've tried. I want to do what God has called me to do, and that is to speak hope into this community. And, it's, and as we did that, as I did that, as this church did that, this is why the church grew. It brought social change in its time through the 90s. It brought generational sh- shake-ups, marriages and families, and it's still doing that. This church is still having impact in our community, but I think it's only to the ankles or the knees. I think God wants a river to flow out of this church, out of you and out of me. I think he wants to unblock that well and flood that community, flood the coast, and bring a revival, a move of a spirit that changes our community community and helps people dig themselves out of the graves. And I don't think there's anything else they can do. That, well, I know there's nothing else. There's no social services. There's no government agency that can do only what Jesus Christ can do. So let us be the people that know what would Jesus do. Let's read the red and let's be part and, and, and knit ourselves, encourage one another in this great community of faith so that Jesus can use this community to touch our community. Father, we thank you for We did not choose you. In fact, Jesus, you said yourself, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I chose you. Help me, help us. Remember, it's not by our might or power. It's not by what we can or cannot do. Because you chose us, to which we're eternally grateful and thankful, Father. It's not our abilities or lack of abilities. I guess it's more about our availability to you. So as a church on this Vision Sunday, the 32nd year, we thank you, Lord, for what you have done. We thank you for the past and for our brothers and sisters have passed on before us. The many families have passed on before us. Gone to you now, Lord, in heaven. All the way down to Ranga, Ruakaturi, Ruatoria. All the way around this motu, thank you for your presence that has used this church to bring change. Bring Jesus to many, many hundreds of whānau. Thank you for now, Lord. Thank you for today. Here we are. Lord, you began a good work in us back then. And it says you will complete it until the day of completion. Give us grace, Father. Give us grace and faith to completion, to continue this great mahi of this church to completion because there's many more to be saved. So, Lord, Thank you for the calling you placed on this church. That the good work you began way back then to form this community to what it is today. But Lord, we look to the completion. You said you'll perfect it, you'll complete it. So Lord, we ask for grace and we ask for faith to rest upon us. Yours, Lord, grace and faith. To focus on the good work we have created to continue to be that community that changes that you can move through and change our community. If there's anybody here, and, well, I just want to give an invitation for anybody here who wants to uh, uh, to say, yes, Jesus, yes to Jesus. Just say yes to Jesus. I accept the call to follow you. See, in Jesus in the Bible, he, he went to a man called Peter, and, uh, and, and his words touched Peter's heart. And, and, and he said to Peter, follow me. And Peter followed. And the rest is history. And I just feel this morning that Jesus is here. He's here. His spirit is here. And he's saying, follow me. Follow me. Now you might have come through a history of following churches. Or following yourself maybe. Or following ministries. Or following organizations. And they'll always leave you high and dry. Always, they will shipwreck your faith. But if you follow Jesus, if you follow Jesus, oh, he'll never leave you high and dry. He'll leave you full of purpose and destiny and meaning. He'll heal you. He'll give you his joy. He'll change your life. He's here right now. And he's calling 
some people here, follow me. On this Vision Sunday, 32nd year of being a church here, in this service, the presence of Jesus is saying to some, follow me, follow me. And maybe you used to follow him, but something happened and, and you got lost. Well, he's calling you back. No, my, I didn't mind. Come on, son. Come on, daughter. Don't define yourself by the past. Define yourself by who he says you are. Right now, if anybody here wants to follow Jesus, those words I say, follow me. He's speaking to you right now. If that's you, would you just put your hand up right now just to indicate, because I want to pray for you before I close this service. Would you do it right now? Just raise your hand. Follow me. Follow me. The same one that spoke on the shores of Galilee and said to a rugged fisherman, follow me. John, Peter, follow me. And these two uneducated men followed Jesus. And Jesus used them to be part of the change of this world. Just right now, I'm just waiting for you to respond to Jesus, not me. Raise your hand to him. Follow me. If that's you right now, I know he's here. And I know he's talking to you. And your heart's beating a bit faster than it normally would. And it's getting a bit hot there. That's not sweat you're sweating. That's the fire of the Holy Spirit upon you. I want to encourage you, follow Jesus. The best thing I can offer you it's not what I've got, but what Jesus has got. Right now, just respond to Jesus. Just respond to Jesus. And just respond to God bless you, my bro. God bless you. God bless you, bro. God bless you. There's still others here. Respond to Jesus. Respond. The best thing you can do in your life is respond to Jesus. The best thing I've ever done is respond to Jesus. God bless you, Betty. I see your hand. Anybody else? Respond to Jesus. Oh, I hear the voice of God. I hear him saying, I'm speaking to a young man right now. And you're hearing his voice and it's in your puku and it's swirling around like a whirlpool. And it's a deep voice. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Resume the mahi. Resume the hikoi. Resume the path that you started. 